morning again. Uh, for those returning back to this room, you're welcome. Um, my name is Carl, and I'm your host. And for this session, we'll be having Medicaid for long term care, planning for long term needs, and avoiding common pitfalls. The session will cover, as the name suggests, long term Medicare eligibility and important things to keep in mind when looking at how to afford long term care when the time comes. Um, to address this, we have John Estes, who is an attorney at CAPSA Estes, um, a practice, practice consists estate planning, estate administration, um, protective proceedings, including guardianships, conservatorships, and medical planning. Proud to practice strong work for the Colorado State Medicaid Department. If he is not in the office and you want to see him, you want to see him with his two kids and his two dogs outside Abel Farm. So, Brian, plus Harry, welcome, John, so that I see this. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, good morning. Uh, and thank you, Kyle, for the, the introduction. My name is John Estes. I am an attorney here in town. And as he said, my practice does consist primarily of uh, elder law encompassing estate planning, estate administration, Medicaid, and uh, protective proceedings. Today, we're going to be talking about long-term care Medicaid, uh, how it differs from some of the other programs that are out there, some common misconceptions, because it is one similar to uh, Medicare, but they do very different things. Uh, and then how to avoid any issues while you are planning for your own long-term care or helping a loved one plan for their long-term care needs. Okay, so first off, Medicaid in Colorado is broken into two separate programs. And this is a oversimplification but you've got your normal Medicaid. This is for low income. This is your replacement for uh, basic health insurance. You also have long-term care Medicaid, which covers nursing facility or in-home care. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, there's more reporting requirements for long-term care Medicaid. There's more asset disclosure requirements for long-term care Medicaid. So uh, if you know someone who is on Medicaid and what we're talking about does not sound like it applies to their situation, it might be a completely different type of Medicaid. Uh, it can be for uh, elderly individuals, it can be for individuals with disabilities, it can be for anyone who needs assistance with at least one activity of daily living or ADL. And those are things such as walking around, cooking, cleaning, bathing, dressing, the things we do every single day that many of us don't even think about, but if, if you need assistance with at least one of those, you may meet the medical requirements for long-term care Medicaid. It is different from Medicare, which is health insurance for the elderly or for individuals with disabilities, and this is where a lot of confusion comes in, because Medicare is billed as you get to 65 or you have a disability, this steps in. Medicare is similar to the normal Medicaid in that it is a substitute for or addition to your normal health care insurance. But Medicare does not cover a lot of the long-term care needs that individuals have. Um, also, Medicare is an entitlement program, which means if you have a qualifying disability or if you are over the age of 65, you are entitled to get it, you apply, you're automatically going to get it as long as you fill out all the paperwork correctly. There's no limits on how much income you can have. There's no limits on how many assets you can have. Medicaid is often referred to as a welfare program. I prefer talking about it as a safety net program. This is there to help you out once you have exhausted all the other avenues for covering your care needs. It does have strict income limits, which we will talk about. It does have strict asset limits, which we will talk about. 
And here's the differences in coverage. So Medicare will cover up to 100 days of long-term care. If you've got a long-term disability or a long-term health care issue, that's only uh, slightly over three months. It's not going to cover you for the rest of your life. It will help cover with uh, cover prescription drugs you need. You can also have it help out for short-term stints up to 20 days in a uh, skilled nursing facility for rehab purposes. But after those 100 days or 20 days, depending on which situation you are in, expire, Medicaid's going to stop covering and you're back to looking at private pay or some other coverage for your care. Medicaid covers everything that you need for long-term care. Not perfectly, there's issues with some things that once you're on long-term care Medicaid, if you need dental, if you need vision, there's processes that you have to go through that are overly cumbersome, but you can get it. But it is going to cover all of your costs in a skilled nursing facility at a qualifying facility. It can cover all of your in-home costs to have a caregiver come into the home and provide those cares, uh, those services for you in the home. All right, with Medicaid eligibility, and again, for any time I say Medicaid for the rest of this presentation, I'm talking about long-term care Medicaid, not your basic Medicaid. Another caveat is Medicaid is state-specific. Medicare is a federal program. It has the same rules no matter where you are. Medicaid is state-specific. It's a joint federal and state program. So all of the information I'm talking about with Medicaid is Colorado-specific. If you know someone in another state who's looking at this, they're going to have similar rules, but I can't promise that they're going to be identical to what we're talking about. With long-term care Medicaid, there are four primary eligibility criteria. First is you have to be a resident of the state in which you are applying. You don't have to be... Um, you can have multiple places where you live. It's wherever your primary residence is. So if you spend time in multiple states, uh, apply in the state that you spend the most time that you uh, file your taxes in as a primary residence. Obviously, you can file uh, both states if you get income there. But it's wherever you consider your primary residence to be and wherever you want to receive care. You have to have a qualifying uh, need assistance with a qualified activity of daily living. Oftentimes, by the time we're applying for this, it's pretty clear that that's the case. If it is borderline, Medicaid will send someone from another agency or another company to perform an evaluation of your ability to take care uh, and meet your daily needs. That's called a ULTC 100.2, I think is the st uh, still the number for that. If that comes back and Medicaid says, you don't qualify uh, medically, you can always ask for a reevaluation if you were just, you or your loved one was having a good day that day and it just didn't come across the true extent of your needs. The second requirement is you must have income that is three times uh, the supplemental security amount. That number is set uh, annually. It does get a cost of living adjustment. I have the exact number later in this slide, uh, and I can provide copies of this PowerPoint uh, upon request after this. I did not print out copies. But these numbers do get updated uh, automatically, and there are resources where you can find what the numbers are each year. Usually the new numbers come out in April or May, backdated to January, which is not always the most helpful for us but we work on uh, the state's timeline on that, on getting those adjusted numbers. So here is the 2024 numbers. For long-term care Medicaid, you can have income of up to $2,829 per month. The uh, fourth requirement for long-term care Medicaid is what you can have in countable resources. That's $2,000 for an individual. If we've got uh, two spouses that are applying for Medicaid together, that number is $3,000 combined for the two of them. That number does not get an annual adjustment. That has been the number since the long-term care Medicaid program was established long before I was born. 
and there's no indication that that is going to get a cost of living adjustment anytime soon. That would require new legislation, and that's not really being talked about or touched at the moment, at least as far as expanding what people can have. Uh, there are spousal protections uh, for um, individuals, and if both spouses are applying, you get double the income limit. That does come in when we're talking about what gets counted in a Medicaid application and meeting those criteria. All right, so income is anything that you are receiving. It is not defined the same as taxable income. It is not defined the same as income for other government programs. So if you're familiar with how income is treated for programs such as SNAP or TANF or um, Social Security, it's different for Medicaid. Each of those programs has their own definitions, and it's different from what is considered taxable income. But we're looking at any income or any uh, resources that are coming in, and that can be uh, earned income from employment. That can be annuity payments that you're receiving from an uh, annuity that you have. That can be uh, retirement income being withdrawn from an IRA, a 401k. Uh, or other pen forms of pension. That can be in-kind gifts you receive from family and friends. Um, so if you've got someone else that's helping out with utilities or with rent, that all gets reported to Medicaid as income in determining your eligibility. Spouses' income is treated separately. So if we only have one spouse that's applying for Medicaid, the applicant spouse's income looks at that 2800 number. The non-applicant spouse's income is not looked at in factoring in whether or not the applicant is eligible for long-term care Medicaid. And that does play in when we're looking at ways to help protect assets for the non-Medicaid spouse to keep them you know, in the community with their normal standard of living. You can play around with how that income is treated. There are a number of spousal protections uh, to help out the non-Medicaid spouse. The one of those is the minimum monthly, uh, monthly minimum needs allowance. Uh, maintenance needs. I'm missing one M in there in the, in the uh, description. Monthly minimum maintenance needs allowance. If we've got uh, two spouses with disparate income amounts, and the Medicaid spouse was, say, the primary earner. They're the one that paid in more to that pension or to that um, retirement account or into Social Security, and they have the higher monthly payment. Then what this serves to do is transfer some of their monthly income to the non-applicant spouse to make sure that they can continue to meet their needs. Uh, this amount is a range. There is a minimum amount that we need to bring it up to, and then there's a maximum amount that Colorado will allow. And whether you uh, can bring it up to the minimum or the maximum is uh, a calculation based on a formula where you can put in your rent, your utilities, your cost of water, electricity, any uh, medical uh, expenses, prescription drugs, whatever, and it will spit out, this is what you're entitled to bring your income up to. And then once the Medicaid applicant is on Medicaid, the first portion of their income gets transferred to the spouse to get them up to that number. And if this sounds complicated or if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those later. It's uh, simplest terms is it's a formula to make sure the non-applicant spouse can continue to stay in the community, live in their home, meet their needs. Uh, if the non-applicant spouse is the higher earner um, and has enough to meet those needs, this does not really apply. All right. For married couples, um, yeah, income is still separate. If you're applying together, the income is all lumped together. From a planning perspective, we get to play around with income a little bit more than assets. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the assets, but also uh, because they are separate, 
you know, we can try and uh, set up more of the income to go to the non-applicant spouse to make sure their needs are protected. The second way that we can play with this is this is not a hard and fast number. If you uh, remember a couple slides ago, the maximum amount of income you're allowed to have is just over $2,800 a month. The average cost of nursing facility care in Boulder County is much closer to $10,000 a month. So you can see there's a pretty big gap there where you may be over the income limit, but be making nowhere near enough to cover your ongoing medical costs. In instances like that, we can use a declaration of income trust. And as far as trusts go, this is a trust document. This is not a trust document where you need a lawyer. This is not a trust document where we get creative with it. This is a trust document that Medicaid has put together and we fill in the blanks. And what this trust document does is it says, if you are over $2,800 a month in income, but you are under the average nursing facility cost in your region, then we add whatever your excess income is into that trust and use that money to pay your patient payments towards your care and you are eligible for Medicaid. So if you are concerned that you're not going to be eligible for Medicaid because you're making $3,000, $4,000 a month, but you still can't meet your care, it's not a big concern. Come talk to myself or there are Medicaid planning professionals uh, who specialize in this who can help you out with that process. Uh, some Medicaid technicians, if you're doing this by yourself, are helpful and some aren't. It's hit or miss, but uh, many of them do have the right intention. Uh, there's just high turnover in that, so what they're able to help out with is not always consistent. You have run out of what's on here. I do not have printouts, but I am happy to provide this to you um, afterwards. I can email it uh, or make it available. Kyle can uh, provide some assistance with that as well. Yeah. Are you going to answer questions after? I, I will have time for questions afterwards, so if you're thinking them, hold on to them. I will uh, provide time, and I believe I am the last uh, presenter in this room, so I know we got a little bit of a late start uh, because I was not, uh, I'm, I'm using uh, my kid's computer which did not have PowerPoint on it, so Kyle had to help me out. Um, so I am happy to stay afterwards and answer all questions. All right. Um, Yeah, so we'll come back to the trust in a second. On the eligibility, so we've talked about the income. I said that this can be provided for long-term care needs or care in the home. Each state is allowed to seek waivers from the federal government for what services Medicaid provides. There are certain services they must provide, and then they can request to be able to provide others with Medicaid funds. Colorado has been one of the most aggressive in this country in seeking permission to provide Medicaid to people in their homes, what is called home and community-based services. There are 16 different waivers that you may be eligible for. So if you, want, uh, if you need assistance and don't want to go into a facility, that shouldn't stop you from looking to Medicaid as a possible source of payment for that because you likely are eligible under one of those waivers to have in-home care provided for you covered by long-term care Medicaid in Colorado. All right. So I'm gonna, before we get into trust, I'm going a little bit out of order, but I'm gonna talk about assets because that's going to inform the trust conversation as we start planning. Medicaid has that strict $2,000 limit on countable resources. And that's, what do you own? In defining countable resources, it's easier to define what is not countable, because that list is much smaller. Your equity in your home is not countable up to a certain threshold amount. That amount is roughly $650,000. That number does change every year based on home prices in Colorado. Life insurance policies are countable only to the extent that they have a cash benefit. So death benefit is not counted, but if it can be cashed out, the cash, uh, cash out value is counted. 
irrevocable life, uh, irrevocable burial policies are not counted. One vehicle is not counted. And that can, if it's a couple applying, we generally look at what is the most expensive vehicle. That's the one we're not counting. The other one does count. And then personal property, you know, furniture, clothing, technology, those types of things are not countable. There are a couple other exceptions that don't come up very often, but effectively everything else is a countable resource and counts towards that $2,000. And for resources, we don't separate that out between a married couple. So if you are applying for Medicaid and your spouse is not, it does not matter whose name the asset is titled in, it counts in seeing whether we are at that $2,000 amount. However, if you have a non Medicaid spouse, the community spouse that I've mentioned a couple times, they get some protection on what assets they can have and still have um, their spouse be on Medicaid, and that's called the community spouse resource allowance. That number does change every year as well. Currently, that number is 150,600, which means if one uh, person in a couple is applying for Medicaid and the other is not, they can have a combined $152,600 in countable resources and be eligible for Medicaid. Also important, that number is a, when there's a couple applying, that number is a snapshot in time. So if uh, the individual is not married and applies for Medicaid, they have to have under $2,000 when they apply, and they have to keep it under $2,000 the entire time they are on long-term care Medicaid. If it is a married couple that is applying, they can have $152,000 when they apply, and once the Medicaid spouse is approved, the non-Medicaid spouse can regrow their equity over that $152,000 number and not jeopardize the eligibility of the Medicaid spouse. All right. There are four Medicaid compliant trusts. And this is a trust where you can be a beneficiary and not jeopardize your Medicaid status. The first one we already talked about is the income trust if you are over income. That's this first one, and that's you're over the income limit, but you still don't have enough income to cover your Medicaid needs. The second is, I'm sorry, I misspoke. There are three Medicaid compliant trusts, and there's one non Medicaid compliant trust that we use in Medicaid planning. I'll talk about that later. So, second is a disability trust. This is a first person trust, meaning it is funded with the Medicaid recipient's assets. These often get used in cases where we didn't advance plan well. Someone is on long term care Medicaid. They receive an inheritance from a deceased loved one that's going to jeopardize their long-term care. And so we put together one of these disability trusts to keep them on Medicaid and use the trust assets to cover things Medicaid does not. You know, again, clothing, uh, some of the things that Medicaid is difficult to work with, dental, vision, hearing, um, or if we need uh, improved technology so they can stay in touch with loved ones. Though these trusts only can be used for things that Medicaid or some other government program does not cover. They cannot have the uh, individual themselves as the trustee. It has to be someone else. And they cannot compel distributions from the trust. So the Medicaid recipient can request that the trustee give them assets, but they cannot require that the trustee give them assets. The biggest difference between uh, disability trusts and special needs trusts, which we will talk about, are that with disability trusts, in order for Medicaid to approve it, and Medicaid does have to approve it for you to not lose your Medicaid, Medicaid has to be the contingent beneficiary, meaning once the uh, first beneficiary, the Medicaid recipient, dies, Medicaid gets to say, trust, whatever's left, you pay to me to reimburse me for what I have paid for the Medicaid recipient. 
If there's money left after that, it can go to whoever uh, else the other beneficiaries are, children, siblings, whatever. But Medicaid gets reimbursed first. Pooled trusts are a form of disability trust. It's where all of the assets are held together, thus being pooled together, and it is then being run for multiple Medicaid beneficiaries or uh, beneficiaries uh, with disabilities. And typically this is held um, by, I don't know, I'm blanking on the uh, acronym. Um, I will come back if I think about who typically acts as the trustee for these. Um, I think it's CPD, Center for People with Disabilities here in Colorado. Basically, all of the assets get held in one account and get distributed to the different beneficiaries. Um, otherwise, it is very similar to a disability trust. It's using uh, the individual's own assets, and Medicaid is the contingent beneficiary. The last form of compliant trust for Medicaid is what's known as a third-party special needs trust. Third party means it's being funded. All the assets are being added to the trust by someone other than the beneficiary of the trust, other than the Medicaid recipient. And it does not have to have Medicaid as the contingent beneficiary when the first beneficiary dies. You can have your choice of contingent beneficiaries. Otherwise, it's gonna look very similar to a disability trust. It covers the things Medicaid does not cover. And uh, it has to have a trustee who is not the beneficiary themselves and who has discretion on what distributions get made, what don't. So again, the, ben uh, the beneficiary of the trust can request but not compel distributions from the trust. All right. All of that is you know, how we work with Medicaid. Perhaps the most important thing and the area where most errors in planning or emergency situations arrive comes from we have a five-year look-back period. So when you apply for long-term care Medicaid, they've got all their restrictions on this is how much assets you can have, this is uh, who can control it, this is what your income can be. Medicaid realized hey, people are just going to gift all of this away to get down to that amount, and then we're going to be stuck paying for it when that's not the idea of the program. The idea of, uh, all of this makes sense if you look at it from Medicaid being designed to say, you have done everything you can to meet your own health care needs. You have exhausted all of your available opportunities, and we don't want you to die because you don't have that. So once you have used up all of your needs, we will step in. And for a long time, there was a much shorter look back period which, with much different rules. And Medicaid found people were talking with attorneys like me, but not me, because this all happened before I got my license, uh, and saying, I want to preserve as much of my assets for my family as possible, and I want the government to pay for my health care. And so they would gift it away to their children, spend down artificially, and then get on to Medicaid. And Medicaid said, we're done with that. So we now have a five-year look back that says from the moment you apply for long-term care Medicaid, we have a right to look at every transaction you have engaged in over the previous five years. And if you have given away anything without receiving fair compensation in return, then we're going to impose a penalty period during which you are not allowed to receive long-term care Medicaid. That penalty period is calculated based on the value of the gift. It does change because it is contingent on what the average nursing facility cost in your region is. But roughly speaking in Colorado, every $10,000 you give away means you are ineligible for one month. That's a rough ballpark estimate. And there are strict rules around this where you can mess up without really thinking about it. So those are some of the pitfalls that I want to talk about now. Also important, there is no maximum period of ineligibility. So if you give away assets to, uh, that cause a peri uh, period of ineligibility more than five years, they are not restricted to just that five year look back. They can say you're ineligible for 10 years, 15 years, whatever. If you end up in that situation, um, 
hopefully you didn't get advice, because if you got advice, whoever did it um, was negligent. There's, there's ways to avoid that. All right. That transfer without consideration, the uh, Medicaid department gets a presumption that you did it with the intent to qualify for Medicaid. So if you did it for some other reason, and you say, you know, I gave this away, I didn't get fair value, but I have good reason for it, and it had nothing to do with my eligibility for Medicaid whatsoever. The burden is on you to convince first the county, and if the county won't agree with you, to convince an administrative law judge that your reason is sufficient to rebut the presumption that Medicaid gets um, to say. So an example might be, I was healthy. My son had uh, severe medical problems. I paid for his medical care. And then my health deteriorated within the next five years, and I ended up needing Medicaid. But at the time I made the gift, there was no reasonable assumption I would need Medicaid. I had sufficient money to meet my needs. You know, that's an example, and that's perhaps the best one you could present to an administrative law judge. Still is no guarantee. Um, but any of these counts as that transfer without consideration. So if you're entitled to income and you choose not to take it, you waive your right to that income, that's a gift that Medicaid's going to say is going to cause a penalty period. If you are the beneficiary of someone's estate, either under a will or under intestacy, and you disclaim that interest, you file paperwork in that case saying, I don't want to receive my share, the value of what you would have received counts as a gift. Obviously, direct <coughs> gifts to friends, family member, whoever, count as a transfer without consideration. Transferring assets into an irrevocable trust of which you have no control counts as a transfer without consideration. Um, married couples have a right to a spousal elective share, which is even if your spouse writes you out of their will, you can claim up to 50% of the estate. If you fail to do so, that could be a transfer without consideration. Um, family allowance from the estate, so if the estate's insolvent, but uh, you know, there's creditors that are going to eat up the whole amount, but you don't take the part that's protected. Um, if you are injured and you decide not to uh, avail your rights through insurance or personal injury, that could be. That one um, is very much a gray area, depending on uh, a weighing of all of the factors. Um, and transferring assets into an irrevocable private annuity. Um, this is an annuity that is not purchased from a commercial company. So if you are working with someone like Krauss Financial Services, who is one of the primary Medicaid annuity providers in the country, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're paying to a friend and saying, I'm giving you this money and you're going to pay the annuity payments for the next 10 years, that's not a commercial entity, that would be a transfer. Um, Again, okay, any irrevocable entity, mostly we're talking about trust. This could also be um, some forms of business that it could structure. Um, and not exercising your rights in divorce proceedings. Again, this came out of case law from where uh, spouses were looking at one person maybe has now advanced dementia, Alzheimer's needs long-term care, and they get creative and say, well, you're going to go on to Medicaid. We've got way over the 150,000, so we're going to get divorced. And you know, purely coincidentally, the Medicaid spouse is only going to take $2,000 from the total assets. The non-Medicaid spouse is going to walk away with the rest. Uh, that would cause a period of ineligibility under this. So the upside of this is Medicaid planning is no longer a viable reason to get divorced. You should only get divorced for non-legal reasons, you no longer happy, whatever. There's lots of good reasons to get a divorce. Thankfully, you don't have to for Medicaid that was really anymore. Um, and so, specific examples. Um, promissory notes. If you make a transfer to someone, this typically happens with family members. You say, I'm going to loan you $100,000. You need to have a promissory note in effect that says, I'm going to be paid back under that. 
And in order for it not to be a transfer without consideration, you have to be receiving at least market rate interest. You can't do the family 0% balloon payment when, you know, when pigs fly um, <laughs> in there. It has to be a commercially viable promissory note, otherwise it will be treated as a transfer without consideration. And then the one I help a lot of my clients with and a lot of people get into trouble with is you end up having a family member that is providing a lot of your care because you need help with activities of daily living. We look to family or friends first often for this before we start looking to professionals. And that is wonderful and I support uh, families doing this. I do support uh, them taking care of themselves as well. I see too much burnout. This is unrelated to Medicaid planning, but just in my practice, I see a lot of family burnout. If you are providing uh, care to loved ones, make sure you are taking care of yourself as well. All right, that PSA done. If you are providing care to family members, Medicaid is going to presume that you are doing that out of love and not out of a desire to be paid for, it, even though you are using up your valuable time. You can get around this by having a written contract that says, this is what I'm going to be doing for my loved one. I'm going to be bathing them this many hours per week. I'm going to be cooking for them this many hours a week. I'm going to be driving them to doctor's appointments. I'm going to be advocating for their care. Whatever. You're going to spell all of that out in a contract. You're going to estimate what your total time is going to be per week. And then you are going to say, this is my hourly rate, this is what I'm going to be paid, and you're going to keep detailed blocks of all of that time. You're going to have that agreement signed before you pay anything. So if you've been doing this for a couple months and say, oh, I would, you know, this is really taking way more time than I expected. I thought I was going to be helping you two hours a week. I'm helping you 20. I need to be compensated for that. That's a, a choice between you and your family, but as far as Medicaid is concerned, you don't start getting paid until that contract is signed. Uh, you can't backdate it. You can't pay for services already rendered. Um, compensation has to be comparable to open markets. So you can't say, well, I'm going to provide this at $100 an hour. Um, do a little bit of research, find out what in-home care costs. You can be anywhere within that reasonable range. It has to be spelled out in advance. And then you have to keep an accurate log, not just of what you said you're going to do, but of what you actually did. All of this does come into determinations of eligibility far more frequently than uh, most people imagine. And it does get scrutinized fairly heavily when it is an issue. Um, so keep all that documentation and be ready to uh, reimburse for anything that Medicaid says you didn't provide adequate documentation for or to waive your right to payment if that becomes an issue because that's often the easiest way to get the person on to Medicaid. But if you do plan uh, and put this contract in place, you absolutely can be compensated for your time in caregiving your loved ones. All right. Oh, um, assets transferred in exchange for contract for personal services for future services. There are very few exceptions to this rule. You cannot prepay services. So prepayments will count as a transfer without consideration in most cases. Here there are a couple exceptions. One of the most important ones for me and my clients is you can pay an attorney's retainer. So if I'm helping you with the Medicaid process, that retainer is not paying me for what I've already done. It is paying for me for what I am going to do. That does not violate this. There are some other uh, services that that can be used for. Uh, occasionally, you'll get it approved for prepaying an accountant. If the timing isn't working, you know you're going to need assistance with tax prep, but you don't need that assistance for another nine months. We can have stuff like that. Uh, there are some professional services that are not available for this, but you can't say, my daughter is going to provide services for the next six months to me, so I'm going to pay her 30000 now, and that will cover the next six months of care. Medicaid looks uh, down on that. All right. What things that don't count as transfers without consideration? Any property that's titled to a spouse is not a transfer without fair consideration. You look at all those assets jointly. What that means from a planning perspective is if we've got one person that's going on to Medicaid and one who is not, we will 
usually transfer all of the assets into the non-Medicaid spouse's name for a variety of reasons, and that's not going to cause any transfer without consideration. Uh, children who are under 21, so they are dependents, if they are disabled, uh, and siblings who already have an equity interest in the home and have been living in there at least one year before you go on to Medicaid. Uh, if you have a son or daughter who is providing you in-home care, living with you in the home, providing that care to you for at least two years before you go on to Medicaid or before you go into a long-term care facility, you can transfer the home to them and that's not going to cause a period of ineligibility. But they have to have been providing you care for that time, not just living with you for that time. Um, and then you can transfer into trust. When we are transferring with, into trust, thank you, Kyle. Um, there are a couple things to be aware of. The first is we often use revocable trust in estate planning for a number of reasons. Any assets that are in a revocable trust when you apply for Medicaid count towards that $2,000 limit, even if they, uh, the asset would have been exempt if it was not owned by the trust. Most common example, you retitle your home into the trust. If it's in your name alone, it doesn't count towards that $2,000 limit. If it's in the trust, now the whole value of that counts against that $2,000 limit. There are reasons for it. They don't make sense. Um, to, to most people on first glance, but it has to do with Medicaid's estate recovery rights afterwards, which I will talk about a little bit. Um, and benefits of individuals under 65 who are totally disabled, that's one, uh, similar to if you were transferring to a disabled child, so that's why trusts into that are uh, permissible. Medicaid's logic there is if I'm giving you uh, a house or some other asset and you're totally disabled, by giving you that asset, you're going to be less reliant on Medicaid or other public services in the future, so you're saving us money. We'll, we'll permit that from a public policy perspective. All right. Rebuttable, rebuttable presumption. I'm going to go through very quickly. You have the burden. It's clear and convincing evidence uh, that it was for some other purpose and no reason for the transfer included Medicaid eligibility. Walk away from this knowing if you are in this position where you are arguing this, you're probably going to lose. Uh, Medicaid is not forgiving, and their regulations are very strict on what does qualify as a rebuttable presumption. And if you end up in front of an administrative law judge arguing this point, I'm not telling you not to argue because there are certainly times where that's the only course of action available to you, but their hands are largely tied. All right. There is an exception for undue hardship. If you would be, uh, if your immediate health care needs would be jeopardized by having a period of ineligibility, you can petition the county to give you a waiver for undue hardship. They're not going to grant this if you just gave everything away willingly. But uh, where I have seen this a couple times is uh, instances where someone gave everything away, the, the family example, I paid for a family member's medical expenses and then now I need my own. That could be a good reason for a hardship. I've got nowhere else to go. I've got no family that can take me in and provide me services. I've got no friends that can take me in and provide me services. By the time you're Medicaid eligible, you already have no assets to pay for your services. They make sure of that with their own regulations. And if I don't keep my long-term care, I'm at immediate risk of uh, substantial physical harm. Okay, that's where my slides end. Um, I did want to talk about one planning technique. So with that five-year look back, if you have enough assets to cover your medical needs for at least five years, and leaving an inheritance is a primary objective of yours, there are gifting strategies where you can preserve some of those assets. The most common is a uh, what I refer to because my mentor referred to it as a NIFIT trust. It stands for no income principle or interest. We use it solely for Medicaid planning purposes. It's an irrevocable trust 
that you, the uh, client is not going to be the trustee of. They can't control it. They're going to make a trusted person the trust, uh, trustee of that trust. And in order for it to work, the uh, person funding it cannot also be the beneficiary of it. We put in there enough assets that we want, all the assets we want to protect, we keep out enough assets to cover five years and then some of uh, expected long-term care costs. And under no circumstances do we apply for Medicaid within five years of funding that trust. Because if we apply in four years and 364 days, the entire value of everything we put into that trust gets factored into that uh, period of ineligibility calculation and you're gonna be ineligible for a while. So if you run out of funds before that, there are mechanisms to protect you, but they all require that you've got trusted people to help out. You've got family that's in a position to cover your costs, and you really trust that trustee. Um, the other piece of this is the estate recovery piece, and, and I'm gonna cover that quickly, and then I will open it up to all of your questions and stay until we get all of them done. When you are on long-term care Medicaid, the state keeps track of all of the money that they spend on your care. <coughs> so they are keeping track of every uh, drug, every um, room and board payment, everything that they spend from the moment you are eligible for long-term care Medicaid. When you die, they can seek to be reimbursed by your estate for everything that they have paid for your care up to that point. So they're treating it as a loan that we can get paid back from. Usually they go after the house for that. That's usually the only asset that's left that can even reasonably cover that. There are exceptions to estate recovery. One of those is if there's a surviving spouse as the sole beneficiary of the estate. Estate recovery comes out. If you had a son or daughter, a child that was providing you care for two years and living in the home with you, and they are now the beneficiary. So we didn't transfer it during life, but they're now the beneficiary of the property at death. That's exempt from estate recovery. There are undue hardship exemptions from estate recovery, and uh, if the beneficiary is a disabled individual under the age of 65, they, that's also exempt. Otherwise, Medicaid can go after everything that's part of your estate after you die. <coughs> That's the reason that we, when we're working with couples, we transfer everything to the non-applicant spouse so that it's in their name and we don't even trigger an inquiry of state recovery in most cases. Right, I've covered, uh, I think, a fair amount of information. I want to open it up to questions for the rest uh, of our time. Yes? You said they go after all of the estate. Does that include life insurance? If there is a life insurance payment that is still uh, made to the estate, yes. If it's made to beneficiaries, no. Uh, so if, if the life insurance policy has designated beneficiaries, they're not going to go after that. Again, uh, if there's a life insurance policy that has a cash value, it's going to be counted in that resource uh, count in the application stage. But, yeah. Yes. Are the services that you're talking about um, typically provided by an elder law attorney, or is it a, a specialty? So many elder law attorneys do practice Medicaid planning as well. Um, most of the ones that I know in this area have uh, varying comfortabilities with Medicaid planning, um, but. Um, I can speak to individual uh, attorneys, but most of the elder law attorneys in the you know, Boulder Corridor and Northern Colorado area, if they are advertising themselves as uh, elder law attorneys, I know most of them. Most of them have a pretty good understanding of Medicaid planning. And then there are non-attorney uh, assistance uh, companies that help out with the application process themselves. Uh, I'll give a, a plug for one of them that I work with extensively, which is Helping Hands Consulting. Working through the Medicaid application process itself, they are one of the best available. And are there, is that a nonprofit organization? They are, they are a for-profit. They charge for their services. They are not inexpensive, but they are good. 
Yes. Earlier in your presentation, there was a question about if you're married, two people, uh, you're married, then uh, one goes in. <coughs> what is considered income as to the one goes in and the one that doesn't go in? Are they combined or not combined? They are separate. So incomes remain separate throughout the whole process. So if I, if one person is the main, has most of the pension, and the other one doesn't, that person, that, if that person went in that doesn't have the pension, they're not going to in, consider the other person's pension for their... Correct. Okay. Yes. You have cards. I do have cards. Uh, I've got them setting up right next to this computer. I'll move them over here so you can grab them on the way out. Actually, I will do that while we're still talking so I don't forget. And how about getting a copy of your presentation? <coughs> how can they do that? Um, Could you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, getting a copy of the presentation? Uh, I'm happy to email that to anyone that would like. Um, if you don't mind waiting for a little bit, I'll grab my computer, I'll get email addresses, and I will email my presentation to anyone who's interested. And the, the other question that I had was that, uh, when you just said that, it uh, threw me off here, so I'll pass me on. Okay. Yes. Oh. I'd like to know how the how Medi Medicaid views fees paid to attorneys or other people in this process if you're not allowed to overspend your gift money away as they do this sort of look back process how do they view all of that yes yeah, so it depends on the professional um as i said attorney's fees are not a transfer without consideration the presumption is you're getting value for your services and i certainly hope that every attorney you're working with is giving you value for your services um, you can prepay that. So there's an understanding that some professions do require that amount up front. They don't count that against you. Um, so uh, most professions that have a standard industry practice of having some sort of a retainer, those retainers, even though they are for future fees, don't count. Now, Medicaid does reserve the rights to challenge that. So if you came into my office and you said, John, I'm going to give you $50,000 to represent me in this Medicaid application, and we're going to put that into a retainer. Medicaid's going to flag that right away and say, that's not reasonable within the context of Northern Colorado Attorney Services for this. That sure looks like an attempt to set funds aside and get them back later, because when you're working with an attorney, whatever I don't bill comes back to you. So they will look into reasonableness of those attorney fees. Now, if they're looking, and, and that's going to depend on area, Boulder's a different market from Longmont's, a different market from Fort Collins, but yeah, they're going to flag, oh, we've got $10,000 in an attorney retainer, or, or more than that. Give us more information. Something's not adding up here. Uh, this is probably either easy or inapplicable. Um, if you, uh, your Medicare and Medicaid goes to a large medical group, <laughs> and they don't provide the services they promised. Yeah. Is it difficult or lengthy to get out? Do you know anything about how to deal with that? Getting out of a facility? Getting out of a, of a care unit that's taken by social, my Medicare and Medicare. Okay, I can't speak to Medicare. Uh, I know just enough to be dangerous about Medicare. Medicaid. Every Medicaid provider in the state has to be a Colorado-approved Medicaid provider. You get to choose which Medicaid provider you go to. So if they are not providing the services that you need, you can, look for you can go to another Medicaid provider. Now, that's easier said than done, not because getting out is hard, but because getting into a new place is hard. The person that you want to have in mind, if that happens to you or a loved one, is the ombudsman's office. So there's a uh, office of the ombudsman for long-term care. Their job is to advocate for patient rights in nursing facilities or who are receiving long-term care. If a facility is not doing what they say, you get on the phone with the ombudsman and get them in to investigate. 
Is that with the government or with the medical group? It's an outside of the medical group. It's a uh, state position. It's almost always held by an attorney that practices in this area. So the ombudsman that I worked with at the start of my career was also a colleague who did a lot of Medicaid planning. Um, the current ombudsman is also an attorney, but I think focuses it more, more of her practices really deal with patient advocacy than uh, client advocacy. And you can also contact your local area agency on aging. Yeah. Oh. So the Boulder County AAA, or in this region, um, the Denver Council of Regional Governments AAA has a group of ombudsmen. Yeah, and, and they, thank you, that's a, I, I didn't think of them off the top of my head, but that's an excellent source, the Boulder um, Area Agency on Aging is one Yes? Is uh, a disability, uh, if you're receiving disability from the military, they determine the disability mm -hmm. and you're receiving that income, is that exempted or not? That is not exempt in okay. accounts towards Medicaid. Uh, and that does, uh, I'm just going to, bring up a tangent, but just as income is defined differently in every setting, disability is as well. So if you are approved disabled under one government program, that does not necessarily mean that you are approved under Medicaid, although there is a large overlap. But um, just as when you're planning, um, understand that you may get some pushback on that, even if you have been approved under some program. Yes. So this, I've just heard through informal conversations, so I have no idea what sure. the substance is. But um, I've heard that there are a number of private long-term care institutions that refuse to accept Medicaid residents. And so if someone is self-funded for a while and then their assets get to a point where they qualify for Medicaid, they might not be eligible to remain at that institution. Can you comment at all on how private long-term care institutions are part of the program or, or you know? Yes, I can. Know I mean. uh, yeah, so this is actually a great question and I'm gonna give a little bit longer of an answer on it. So every Medicaid provider has to be approved by the state. Not every long-term care provider is also a Medicaid provider. So if you are receiving care at one of those facilities that is not a Medicaid provider, they will keep you as long as you are private pay or private insurance pay. Once you are on Medicaid, they will force you to leave and go find some place that is. Now, as a practical matter, if you are looking at long-term care Medicaid at some point as part of your planning process, you want to get into a long-term care Medicaid provider facility at least six months before you expect to need Medicaid. Because what those Medicaid provider facilities will do is they'll play a game that says, we don't have Medicaid beds, but we do have private pay beds. And if you can commit to paying us six months of private pay, then uh, we will have a Medicaid bed for you at that time. This is not consistent with the spirit or the uh, actual provisions of the regulations, but there's no good way to challenge it. Um, this is my opinion and many of my colleagues' opinion is that this is a blatant breach of their agreement with the state of Colorado that, uh, for what they are required to do to be a Medicaid provider, but we don't have an enforceable means to hold them to it. So if you are going to go into and you have long-term care Medicaid as part of your planning, even if you're going to do a private pay-only facility for most of it because it's a good fit, you like the quality of care, you are going to get more intensive care, get out before Medicaid kicks in and get into a Medicaid provider while you can still private pay because it will be an easier process. It is very difficult to rehome a Medicaid client when it's, all right, I'm now on Medicaid, who's gonna take me? Uh, we, we end up seeing not as many, you don't have as good a choice, and you end up being funneled into the less high quality facilities. Yes? I heard that there are only three Senior residences in Boulder County that accept Medicaid. Um, Mesa I, Vista in Boulder on 20th and Mesa, and um, I think there might be one here. But there, mo most of them do not accept Medicaid. There is a lack of uh, facilities here. It is more than three. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. 
Um, my, what are they? Um, uh, Alta Vida here in town. Alta Vida takes Medicaid. Do they have a poor door or because um, Alta Vida is a nice facility? It's mm -hmm. new. Yeah, that's one of the ones that I have uh, worked with my clients to get into. Off the top of my head, I don't remember which other ones do uh, because they have to review every year, so there is some turnover. Um, um, but you have identified a, a problem, which is I don't think that there are enough to meet current needs. No. Um, and having worked with uh, long-term care Medicaid straight out of law school, I worked with the nursing facilities that was I, I was one of their liaisons. Um, there was not exactly a rush to get more facilities in. And, uh, it's, un it's unfortunate, it needs to change, and it's not looking like it is. Yes? Um, yeah, I've run out of time, so okay. I'll take the last question. Absolutely. Uh, last question. Do you know how, about how long it takes um, from applying to Medi for Medicaid and getting approved and getting benefits? Is it like. <laughs> Could you be louder? Uh, yes, I, I, will re I will repeat the question. The question is, how long from the time that you apply for Medicaid until you get your determination that you're either approved or denied? Is that correct? Yeah, and then, and then like also to, until you get start getting benefits. Okay. Um, I'll answer everything that I think is, is relevant to this question. So the first part is longer than it should. <laughs> Typically, we're uh, in Boulder County. We are looking at three to six months from application date until uh, approval or denial. That is inconsistent with Medicaid's own regulations. Their regulations say they have to have a determination to you within 45 to 60 days. They are routinely outside of that, and there is zero enforcement mechanism. So if they are being slow, you don't have a legal way to say you were required to do this faster, do it faster. So it, we, we work on their timeline. It took me three years to get approved for Medicaid. Wow. Um, however, once you are eligible and apply, if you are receiving services through a Medicaid provider, notify them that the application for long-term care services has been submitted because they will put you into Medicaid pending status. What that means for you is that they stop billing you private pay until a determination is issued. So if it takes three months, if it takes six months, there's a couple reasons you need to notify them. First, if you don't notify them that an application has been submitted, they don't put you into that status. They keep sending you private pay bills. Second, you now have the best advocate you could have for getting a fast turnaround. <laughs> I'm an attorney. I get on the phone with a Medicaid technician and say, my client applied three months ago. They say, that's great. A nursing facility who is a Medicaid provider gets on the phone and says, my patient applied for Medicaid six weeks ago. I haven't been paid. Where's the status? That gets moved up on their list because they want to keep their providers happy because they don't have enough providers. So the best advocate you can have, not necessarily for a positive um, uh, decision, but for a fast decision, is the facility itself. Notify them that you've been put into Medicaid pending. And then the third part is your eligibility date starts not on when they make the decision, but on the date you applied and would be eligible. So if it takes them six months, but it's an, it is approved, they go back and pay for the long-term care from the date of that application. From your original application, even if you've had to apply several times. Oh, wow. The, the, you the can get back pay going all the way yeah. back to when your original application was, once you've finally been approved if you don't give up or and, die, and you which can, they're hoping you will do. <laughs> you can actually hope that the approval date is the date you would have been eligible. So if on your application you realize, oh, I, was medic I had the finances in place two months ago, you can actually go back uh, a little bit. I forget uh, exactly how far, but I think it's up to three months if you would have been eligible prior to applying, you can go back to that. Um, one thing to note about that is if you ask for that, you are then opening up that five-year look-back period to the date you applied minus the time you're seeing. Yes? Would you say it's fair that we should be encouraged because of the lack of Medicaid-eligible facilities in our state 
and the fact that Colorado is one of the fastest aging states in the country, we should be encouraged to plan for Medicaid in our homes, to yeah. be able to provide in-care service, and be advocating <coughs> to our legislators, both at the county level and at the state level, the governor to provide more funding for all of the services for older adults. Yes, so on the funding side, I will say um, there's only so much the state can do. Um, but advocating for expansions to Medicaid uh, is going to be vital, not just in Colorado, but nationwide. We are an aging society. That's not a bad thing. It's just a reality. And the, um, the stats, the numbers tell us that over 50% of the population is going to need long-term care Medicaid at some point. Um, when I was working with the state, and I don't think that this has changed, if anything, I imagine that the um, disparity has grown, but the largest line item on the Colorado budget is long-term care for uh, Medicaid providers. Uh, where it gets somewhat limited is it is a joint federal-state program. And the way that works is half of the money is paid in by the federal government and half has to come from the state. So they have to work with CMS, which is the federal agency that works with both Medicare and Medicaid to approve any funding. Uh, that does not mean it is a waste of time to advocate for legislat uh, legislators to do this. But also, um, if you can take steps to have your home ready for in-home medi uh, Medicaid provided there, that's um, not a bad option uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, from the non-financial side, uh, many people do age better in their homes if they can keep as many of their normal supports in place, if they can keep as much normalcy in, uh, in place as possible. So just from a client outcome perspective, uh, receiving uh, in-home care is not always possible, but where it is, it often does yield better results. Yeah, and I would add too that the funding, the funding advocacy at the state level isn't just for Medicaid, but also for um, basic services because there are wait lists for transportation services, yeah. nutrition services, basic needs that if you end up not being able to get into a facility and need to stay in your home, that you also will need those wraparound services. Yeah. I, I will never speak against advocating for additional <laughs> funding for basic community services. That is never a waste of your time. The more people that hear it from, the better the likelihood that we have. Yeah. Of and I think the voices here in this room are, I mean, we should definitely be yeah. being louder at our right. state level. I, I think we are running out of tape. I appreciate you sticking with me even through a uh, longer session than we had time for. So thank you so much. I hope this information is helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.